differently. And now I'm focused, focused more on advocacy. So that's who I am. Okay. Thanks great. for having me, Lisa. Thank you so much. No, we're so lucky to have you here. Um, let me go to, um, we prepared a couple of slides, but we can, of course, oops, answer your questions as well. Um, evaluations. Um, before Monica gets into more on understanding your evaluations, um, I just wanted to speak a little bit to the parent participation and advocacy part of this. Um, and having attended many IEP meetings, of course, as a parent and many more as an advocate, um, I completely understand how parents feel vulnerable and I understand how you might feel, um, I don't wanna say inferior because inferior is not the right word, but I can understand how when folks are talking about things or an IEP team is talking about things and you are talking with school psychologists and you know therapists and, and things like that, that you might feel intimidated that they know more than you do. Um, and again, I know what it's like to feel vulnerable at an IEP meeting, it feels like like it's almost like it feels sometimes like you're walking in without any skin on or something. Um, but parent training on the IEP is, I mean, it's a thing. It's a real component defined by IDEA. Um, and I wanna encourage all parents to not be intimidated and to ask for help, um, especially in this area, because we are just given these reports. We are just given this kind of pile of gibberish and we're expected to make decisions about our kids future based on you know this pile of information that we don't even really understand um but just like i mean i'm not a plumber so i don't know how to install a toilet um i'm not an, a nurse so i don't know how to install or install or put it you know give a patient an iv line so just like folks don't know how to do our job we don't know how to do their job and we shouldn't be expected to know how to do their job and it's okay to not know how to do their job um you know meaning for them for the school team to enable you meaningful participation um, it might just take an extra session of them sitting with you and explaining the evaluations to you um, so anyway, that's just my little soapbox bit, because I think, I think parents, they see all these evaluations and they're afraid to speak up. They're afraid to ask for help. Um, they're afraid to ask for an explanation because they feel like, well, if I show them that I don't understand what they're talking about, then, you know, they might take advantage of me and so on. Um, so maybe encourage everyone to step out of their comfort zones a little bit and ask for help. Okay. Um, another couple of notes on this is that I always try to get an extra copy if you can. I've been to many, many IEP meetings, of course, where they hand out copies. And since it's the draft, um, they hand them back in for recycling at the end of the meeting. Um, sometimes I take home the extra copy so that I have a clean one and then I have one that I can write on. I can circle it, I can highlight it, I can take all my notes on it um, as I'm doing my record review and going through all of the scores and things like that. Um, but also there are not any shortcuts to this. This is not in my comfort zone. That's why I asked Monica to help. Um, that's why I often ask her to help when I say, hey, you know, a child I'm working with right now got this. What do you think? Um, because there are literally thousands of assessments out there that our kids could get. And um, they're always coming up with new versions of these assessments. So it's, you know, quite often it's just not the same information. And particularly, you need to make sure that you're comparing apples to apples and that, you know, if your child's baselines were done with one set of assessments, when that triennial happens, you want to make sure, you know, you want to ask if it's appropriate to do the same assessments. But if not, you might need someone to explain to you, like how this test differs from this and why the scores are different and so on. Um. <laughs> um, so Dana says, I've been told when they collect them at the end, it's because they can't get out. Um, yeah, I mean, no, there's, I get it. Like they are bound to FERPA 
and I have had a couple of unfortunate situations where folks who should not have been privy to certain IEP information were, um, and children were bullied as a result of that. So yeah, I, I'm certainly mindful of that, but also I'm the parent and I'm, you know, there's nothing wrong with taking a copy and saying, hey, I understand this is a draft, but I wanna go home and, and read up more on this and, you know, I'd like a copy, so. Um, but you know, there are no shortcuts to this. It's, it's very tedious, it's very cumbersome. And that's why I do encourage you to kind of work with your team and learn this stuff. Um, and again, I go back to, you know, Monica herself is actually um, a dyslexia parent. And, you know, it's like you kind of fall into this because you're interpreting these scores anyway, and then you share your knowledge with a wider audience. Um, there's also, we have to go back and visit our statistics classes. If you can remember back that far, I really can't, um, but we do have new vocab terms to learn, which, whoops, which we're going to start. Let me see if Monica is done with her babysitting. Oh, there she is. Okay. I'm here. There's a baby in the background, but hopefully he'll be okay. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, so so kind of following up on what Lisa was saying, you know, it really is the responsibility of the school to make sure that they present the information to you in a way that you understand it. And I completely agree also that it can be very intimidating to ask questions. Um, but, you know, just know that there are people that are there who will answer those questions if you at, um, after the fact go home and you're rethinking something because you're getting a lot of information all at one time at those meetings. And even people who have background in this miss some of the information. So please don't ever hesitate to ask questions. So a lot of the testing that um, school psychologists and speech and language pathologists and occupational therapists and others use are what we call norm reference standardized tests. So the purpose of norm reference tests are to compare the individual to the group, to other kids um, of the same age or the same grade level. And therefore, because of the way these tests are constructed, some of these words that are here on the screen right now might be used or you might hear thrown around. And if they're not used during the meeting, just know that these are things that went into um, the scores and how the scores are calculated and how they are explained to you. So Lisa has put some nice definitions, uh, very understandable definitions. And she asked me if I could explain these, which I can. The mean is just like that average, right? Remember, you probably, we all did this one, even if you didn't take statistics at some point, you probably did this in your elementary school math where we have a, a school and we, add up all the scores and we divide by the total number and get that gets us the mean score. So the mean score is definitely something that's kind of behind the scenes, but what we also talk about are average scores and you know what is typical for a child of that particular age. So you might hear us talk about mean in achievement testing, uh, cognitive assessment, speech and like language assessment and other things. The median is the the middle most score, which is something that's used when these tests, when the psychometric properties of these tests, right, the reliability, the validity, um, the scaled scores, when all those things are being calculated, the median comes into play, but that's probably not a term you're gonna hear during these meetings. Norms and normed tests are something that you will hear. And again, that's this whole idea that um, has are constructed, um, the idea to compare the individual to a group. So the norms are, is the data on that large group that the individual child is being compared to. And then deviation, um, you know, we want to understand how much an uh, individual score deviates or is different from the group. And that's essentially what we mean by deviation. There's another slide here where I'll show you the, the bell curve or the normal curve. And, and I think you have a better idea of what deviation means when you can see that visually. Do you wanna go to the next slide, Lisa? 
Okay, so subtests. So when psychologists and speech and language pathologists and others use um, assessments, a lot of these assessments are what we call assessment batteries, like the Wexler scales are an assessment battery, the Woodcock Johnson is an assessment battery that has cognitive language and achievement. The, the Wexler individual achievement scale is an achievement battery. The Wexler individual scale um, is intelligence is a cognitive battery. And then these batteries are composed of many different subtests that test different types of skills. So um, that's what a subtest is. So you're gonna see when the, the psychologist or whoever is explaining something to you, you're gonna see scaled scores, um, or not scaled score, I'm sorry, index scores that are kind of the uh, overall score for a group of subtests or for all the subtests. And then you'll see individual subtest scores that are often reported as scaled scores. And then the one last one here, percentile or percentile rank, I personally think that is the one that parents find to be the most understandable. And I think it's the most useful in understanding your child's strengths and in, in areas of need. Because percentile ranks are, give us an idea of where that, that individual child fell in comparison and how many scores fell above and below your child. Okay, Next, any questions about those terms? Again, I think, they're more understandable when you kind of see some of this visually. So this is the bell curve or the normal distribution. And when I, um, we're using norm reference standardized tests, these tests have been developed and um, on very, very large groups of thousands of, of students typically, or at the very least hundreds, but most of the big ones, like the ones I've named, like the Wexler scale, Woodstock Johnson, um, and some others out there, Stanford Binet, there, there are literally thousands of students who, or children who have been in that norming sample for these tests. And um, I like this particular, and this is a, a good, maybe I just lay it up as an individual, because what you see here is that norm distribution. And when you measure an enough people or enough of a natural phenomenon even like inches of rainfall and you plot out the scores this is the shape that you typically get this is what we call a normal distribution so um what we are looking for when we had these tests is we're taking the raw scores how the child did on these different sub tests and we're converting all those raw scores into standard scores. And standard scores are, are the things, the scores that they report on cognitive IQ test or um, the, the Wyatt individual achievement test. Those scores have a mean of 100 and a standard deviation of 15. Um, and by the standard deviation, what we mean is what is the typical amount of variation? So, 68% of the population of children that those tests were normed on will have scores that fall in between 85 and 115. On this particular um, app here, it, it's really a little bit, it's not 85, it's like 91 to I think 109 there, and I'll tell you what that means in just a moment. But typically, um, 85 to 115 is where 68% of the scores, most of the scores in a population will fall in that range. So that's the range that we call the average range. And that average range is 100, right? The perfect middle score is 100. And then down below those, you can see percentile ranks. And like I said, I think me, this is really helpful for parents to see the score that's reported, whether it's a standard score um, or a scaled score or a T score, all those scores will also have a percentile rank. And once you know the percentile rank, you know where your child falls on that distribution on that particular skill that was being measured when he or she or they are compared to other children their same age or grade. So I'll pause here to see if there are questions at this point. Okay, 
The one thing I do find sometimes when, and this is the fault of the school, if the parents aren't being, um, or the school isn't explaining this information in a way that the parents can really understand it, um, sometimes parents look at a score of 100 and, or a 90, and they're thinking more like what we see in classroom-based tests where it's a percentage score. Um, so that's a big mistake um, that, that people make. And like I said, that when that happens, that's the fault of the folks that are doing the explaining because they should make that very clear that 100 is an average score. That is typical. That is what's right there in the middle. And then as scores go up, they fall into different descriptive categories. So if you want to go to the next slide, this is another way that uh, and this turned out to be a little small, but like I said, I will make sure that I uh, send these two slides as a handout because I think this is like a handy dandy guide to have as a parent when you're going into these meetings. Because in addition to what is through this range, that plus or minus one standard deviation or um, 85 to 115, we also use descriptive ranges. So if you can think back to the illustration of the bell curve and remember the shading, that what's average, the way what we describe is very typical and average would be scores of 91 to 109. And then low average would be, a, that with a lighter shade of gray would be 81 to 90, or high average would be 110 to 119. So this kind of breaks it down for you what, how we describe those scores. And then it also presents there other types of scores that are often used. So the overall index or IQ scores are typically reported as standard scores. The subtests are typically reported as scaled scores. Sorry for the baby noise. Um, scale scores have a mean of 10. Uh, I'm sorry, but yeah, a mean of 10 and a standard deviation of three. And then we also had T-scores. You'll see T-scores used a lot for be, like rating scales, like behavior rating scales, like the BASC or the Connors. And they have a mean of 60 and a standard deviation of 10. So that's a lot of information to remember, but the thing that's consistent with all these scores is that they all uh, come with percentile ranks. And that's why I said that I think because it's a common thing and you can see where your child falls on that distribution, on the different skills that are measured, it's a very useful statistic. So that's all the statistics. <laughs> that's the heavy stuff. So I'm happy to answer any questions. So I wanna ask or get your opinion on one question I field a lot from parents is that they wanna ask the schools for the raw data. And to that, I always say, well, what are you going to do with it? But um, and then it becomes an argument over and the school says, well, we don't have it or we don't keep it or because of, um, what's the word, because of copyright, we're not allowed to give you the raw data. That's, that's a common one. Um, what's your feeling on that, on parents asking for raw data or seeking it and not getting it and things like that? Um, well, first, I don't think raw data is terribly useful without really understanding how it's being interpreted. Because with these tests, um, these, co these batteries, these cognitive and achievement batteries, they're developed for kids for, with a very, very large age range, right? So those, those, that raw data is pretty meaningless unless you know how to interpret it. And you can't interpret it without uh, converting the scores to the, you know, the different um, scaled scores or standard scores and then understanding them in terms of um, you know, percentile ranks, et cetera. If, if a parent wants to see the kinds of questions that the child uh, was asked on these different subtests, that's a legitimate question. And the, and, the, and the report should always include an example or two of the type of question. Um, parents would have a right to visually inspect the protocol if you still have questions, but it is true that there are copyright issues with um, giving the, the testing companies do not allow for, for those protocols to be copied and given out to parents. And that's for the purpose of protecting the test integrity. These tests are used over and over again. Um, 
you know, in cases where somebody can make a really strong argument that it's absolutely necessary, um, you can get permission to share a copy of the protocol with another professional who's trained because the other reason the test companies don't want this information released is kind of going back to what I said in the beginning. If you don't understand how these tests are used and how to um, take those raw scores and make them into something meaningful, um, they can be misinterpreted. So that's why testing companies do not let us hand over protocols to parents, but they will in extreme situations allow for it to be handed over to another trained professional. Okay, and then the other question or the other situation I run into all the time, and I'm sure you have too, is that, um, you know, a child gets a set of evaluations and then the progress monitoring and or the subsequent, you know, triennials, whatever, it's not the same assessment. So how do you begin to compare, you know, monitor progress or compare apples to apples, as they say, and know how your child has progressed over three years if, and, and I mean, in the school's defense, you know, of certainly some of the tests, the kids age out of them, you know, and, and you're only supposed to do them up into a certain age and you have to move on to a different assessment. But how can parents kind of better wrap their brain around that part of it? That's, that's a really good question. And it's a really hard thing to wrap your brain around. So let me kind of go back to so the, what we're talking about right now and, what, and the part of this that parents usually struggle the most with as far as understanding are these norm reference tests. These are the tests that are most useful for the purpose of determining whether or not the child has a disability, right? Is, are, is their performance in certain areas at the level where the, it's a normative weakness and there's an issue that we need to be worried about? Sorry, somebody's decided to not be happy right now. Um, I mean, we don't care if he's in the video, if you need to hold him. <laughs> yeah, I don't think he wants to be held either. Okay, but anyway, now he's got his bottle now. Okay, so they're not necessarily the best kinds of tests for tracking progress. We really do need another type of test. And when, even when we're making those initial eligibility decisions, remember there's two things that we're looking for. One, does the child meet the criteria to be classified as a student that has a disability? So that really requires that normative comparison. How, how not typical is the child's performance in different areas, whether it's cognitive or achievement. And we need those norm reference tests for that. But we also are supposed to be determining, does the child have a need for specially designed instruction? How are they functioning in the classroom and in the curriculum? Is their learning keeping pace? There's a different, there are different types of tests that do that better. Curriculum-based measures, um, benchmark assessments, things like dibbles, um, even teacher-made classroom tests, like or the end of the unit tests, they are better for measuring the child's progress in the curriculum. If a child is reevaluated and they're given the same test, the same test battery as previously, like the Woodcock Johnson, one reason I like that test, although it's not used a lot in Pennsylvania. Um, but I like it because it can be used for children who are preschool all the way through adulthood, right? So you can use the same exact test and that is nice for making some comparisons. But the way these tests are constructed, if a child achieves the exact same standard score, so the first time they were tested, they had a score of 100, a standard score, and then three years later, they're tested and their score is still 100, that means that your child made progress. It might not look like that because the score is the same, but remember what we're saying there is this is all about comparing the individual to the group. So you, that child has made enough progress to maintain their standing in that norm group. They're in the same place. So it doesn't, but these tests don't tell you like, you know, can my child add and subtract single digit numbers? Can my child, um, you know, answer uh, questions about, information that they may have learned in science and social studies. It doesn't give us the most robust information. So for progress, you really want different sorts of assessments. Hopefully that answered the question. Yes, it's very, you know, that's a very helpful because again, it's, you know, parents get a lot of data. If you have a, you know, even if you don't have a, an IEP, 
your child brings home a lot of stuff from school, but when you have an IEP, you get so much and it can be overwhelming. And to, to kind of discern what, what matters and what doesn't and how do I know and, and things like that, um, that's helpful. Does anyone have any questions? Or did we just overwhelm them and into silence? I know, I hesitate to, this can be a little overwhelming, this content. Hopefully. So I Hopefully guess I did okay. Um, just for like, say some actionable steps, of course, you and I both recommend collectively that you ask your team for help if you can. But let's just say, hey, it's a holiday weekend, it's Memorial Day weekend, and you got your evaluation reports on Thursday, and you want to look at them this weekend, right? Like, how do you start? Or where do you start? Or what would you do first? If you're trying to just make sense of it before you go to an IEP meeting? Well, on the first thing that I would do is just to read through the whole thing. So before you start to zero in on certain things, read through the whole thing, circle things you don't understand or put a question mark on it. Um, but but what I, when I train school psychologists, what I tell them they should be doing, and just so you know, the field is really trying to make uh, school psychologists um, understand this stuff to, so to a level that they can write a more parent friendly report. Um, but what you should do is if I tell my school psychologist, once the parent reads that report, you know, you did a good job if what they say is, oh my gosh, that's my kid. You just described my child. Um, so that would be the first thing that I would recommend is that um, whether or not you read through this and what you're seeing tells you, oh yeah, I recognize that that's what my kid does. Or that No, that isn't what my kid does. So how much you come away with it feeling like, okay, they understand my kid and I'm getting good information here or they're affirming what I already know is the first step. Then write down the questions and that you might have. And then when you're really looking at those scores, like I said, I will send this along to, um, I'll make a handout of these two tables so that you can, Especially the key for interpretation of scores, I think that's very, very useful for parents to, to be looking at when they're looking at the scores. So the, the, the report should be answering two questions. Does my child have some type, the, the, do they meet the criteria for classification as having one of those disabilities that's outlined in IDEA? And, and if they're saying yes, how did they come to that decision? What are, the, what, what are the pieces of information that the school is presenting to say that your child did or did not um, meet that criteria? And then what is it that your child needs in order to you know, start to make progress or start to make better progress? If, if you can't come away from reading the report understanding that, then there's a problem with the report, not with you because that's the school's job is to explain that. Okay, um, all right, Katie has a question. She says, can you repeat where schools are required to explain the tests to parents? School has been avoiding, refusing to answer questions about evaluation protocol and a large discrepancy in evaluation results low versus classroom assessment scores much higher. Well, I mean, I, throughout IDEA, there's not a single sentence in the law, but throughout IDEA, it talks about that information needs to be presented to parents in language that's understandable to them. And oftentimes we think of that, oh, okay, that means if someone doesn't speak English, we give it to them in another language. But that means understandable to them, even if they are speaking English. So that is a requirement of the school. Um, Yes, it would be problematic if you're asking for somebody to answer your questions and no one is answering that. That's okay. Um, so I would suggest that if you're talking to someone at the school level that you bump up your concern to somebody in the district's office to see if you can get your concerns addressed. And every state also, if you can't get satisfaction at the district level, every state has a... Um, Some for parents called State Department of Ed to file complaints, just not even to file complaints, just to get help. So sometimes when you involve in Pennsylvania, 
someone from the bureau will take on a partnership and say, hey, what's going on here? This parent is asking for help and not doing it. So that's Okay. Um, Paula asks, how do you know if the tests that were given are the ones appropriate to reflect your child's strengths and weaknesses? Well, that is, first of all, I have to tell you, this baby has never made this much noise in the entire <laughs> three months I've been babysitting him, my <laughs> grandson in the background. I've never heard him make this much noise, so I do apologize. He usually plays quiet at my feet. Um, it's really fine. Well, how, so, okay, so how you, how you uh, determine if they're giving the right test? It really depends on, you know, what is suspected area of children who are suspected of having a learning disability, you want to make sure that they're given cognitive assessment and to see what, where their strengths, cognitive strengths and possible processing weaknesses are. You want to make sure that they're being given an individualized achievement test and that all the different areas of achievement are being assessed, right? If it's a reading issue, make sure that they're looking at sight word reading and decoding and reading fluency and reading comprehension. Um, if, it, if the suspected disability is language-based, then there's a whole cadre of tests that speech and language pathologists give. If it's a child who might be on the autism uh, spectrum, then there are assessments like the ADOS, there's rating scales. So it, Answering that question is, is difficult because it's going to really depend on what the issues are with your particular child. And that should be informing. And in fact, if you read through IDEA, when the team is deciding what the, the, um, the evaluation will com be composed of, they're supposed to be looking at the data that they have and figuring out what are the things that we need to find out more information on and then selecting assessment tools based on, you know, what more information is needed. Right. Um, and also I think, um, Paul, or Kimberly, I'll get to you in a second. Paula, you want to um, look at the big picture. And we talked about that when we talked about doing a record review and that of course, you know, and as Monica said, you should read this report and say, oh, yes, that's my child. But, um, you know, just as an example, I had a client a couple, a couple of years ago, and throughout the anecdotes given by the different teachers and therapists, um, there were all these stories of sensory seeking behavior. And yet there was no type of evaluation or assessment done for autism. But meanwhile, you know, like these little, um, examples of autistic and sensory seeking behavior were kind of smattered throughout the report, but they didn't evaluate for it. So again, it goes back to that participating in every step of the process and they have to evaluate in every area of suspected disability. So if they don't suspect it, bring it to their attention and ask for it in writing. Um, you know, one that we get a lot of is that the kids struggle, struggle with social skills or they struggle with executive functioning or both and no assessments were done in those areas. Because um, typically they aren't done unless you specifically request them. So again, if that's something, in, if that's an area of need that you're seeing within your child, you wanna make sure that that shows up in the narrative somewhere, because if it didn't, chances are he may not have been assessed for it. Um, okay, Kimberly, maybe this is obvious or lame question. No, there are no lame questions. Um, but wondering, since a test can be for kids age four to 14 or some other range, how is the data compiled if your child is 11? Are you just looking at test results for other 11, 11 year olds when reporting the results? Right, so that's actually a great question. And um, it goes back to what the reason I was saying that, you know, it's hard raw data doesn't really make a lot of sense on these tests because you have to, you know, you have to understand what you do with that raw data and how you interpret it. And yes, so the actual items and subtests that your child will be given will be dependent on their age. And then yes, their performance, their raw performance on those different subtests are compared to children 
who are in an age band. So, and those, and most of the big tests, like the cognitive assessments, like the Wexler and the Woodcock Johnson and uh, the Wyatt Achievement Scale and the KTEA, those age bands are usually uh, three, a three month band. So if your child is 11 years and three months, they are being compared to other children who are 11 years and three months and not kids who are 11 years and nine months. So that's how exact it becomes. And that's it, but that's up to the whoever's scoring it. They, they Co- have correct. Okay. Yeah. And that's why they, you know, they calculate your child's exact chronological age on the day that they're being tested because that that's how you decide what norm table. Um, it's gotten a lot easier for psychologists because a lot of these things are, are now scored by um, software. So, you know, you used to have to really take the time to double check your scores and make sure you turn to the right page and the norm booklet. But now you just plug the scores into the software and it does it for you, but it makes the comparison with that, you know, that age band or grade band. Every once in a while, we use grade norms, not often, but sometimes like, for example, if the child's been retained, it might be more fair for that child to be compared to children in their same grade rather than their same age. Okay. Um, what if your child is 11, but is developmentally delayed emotionally and socially, so she's more like she's nine? How does that factor in? Well, I mean, that would be part of the more qualitative interpretation. So if if the child is being um, assessed for cognitive abilities or achievement scores or language scores, they are compared to other children their same age because what you're trying to determine is, you know, even if it's, if it's something that's emotionally or socially based, how different is that child's performance from other children their same age? Um, on assessments that are looking at social skills, things like, or um, functional skills, things like the, the Vineland scales or the, the BAS, the behavior rating scales that are out there, it's the same idea. You're, yes, your child might have social and emotional difficulties that are showing up behaviorally, but let's look at you know what is typical behavior for a child at that age, and then how does your child compare to that? Okay. All right. Any other questions? If not, I want to thank you, um, Monica, for your expertise. Um, I think, I mean, I find it very helpful. I hope others have. If not, you know, you can ask me questions and I will pass them along or we can um, answer them in the future. I will make sure that you guys get the handout. And the, of course, the video will be available to replay. So, okay. Well, thank you so much. Um, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank All right. You, have sir. a great day.